Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are so pleased uh, to be uh, continuing our wonderful uh, Global Horizons Day. It's been such an honor to be a part of um, this day that we're seeking to kind of offer a sampling platter of all the IRC does um, and the different types of programs that um, we present to the, uh, the Kansas City community. Um, today, uh, we're very pleased to be welcoming Jake Wagner and Anita Dixon to be discussing uh, music and diplomacy. Um, we will uh, be discussing Kansas City's unique contributions to the world of music. Uh, my name is Evan Raplou and I'm the program manager uh, here at the International Relations Council. Um, if you're new to the IRC, we are an educational nonprofit membership organization um, based in Kansas City. Our goal is to create uh, opportunities for you to learn about and discuss the world's most important issues and how they affect us all. Um, so if you have any questions uh, throughout the uh, program, if you just uh, would like to use the Q&A function down at your bottom of your screen, um, we'll attempt to get to as many questions as we possibly can um, throughout what I'm sure will be a very engaging discussion. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers, uh, uh, Jake Wagner and Anita Dixon. Um, Jake Wagner has worked in urban planning and design for the past 24 years in Oregon, New Orleans, Minnesota, and the greater Kansas City area. His work has focused on the development and of new ways to understand local history and heritage as means to build more equitable and just communities. Uh, Wagner is the faculty founder of the U of KC Center for Neighborhoods, a research and outreach unit in the Department of Architecture, Urban Planning and Design, which has worked with more than 200 neighborhood leaders in Western Missouri. Um, and for Anita Dixon, throughout her career, uh, she has focused globally on culture, preservation and economic strategies for international um, urban ethnic uh, development communities with an emphasis on music as an economic driver. Um, Dixon is the recipient of many awards, including Business Woman of the Year from the Black Chamber of Commerce in Kansas City in 2005, the National Association of Black Journalists, and the Apex Award from the Travel Professionals of Color in 2012, the Alumni Hall of Fame uh, Donnelly College here in Kansas City, um, the Historic Kansas City Preservation of, uh, Award in 2018, and most recently, the recipient of the Public Service Award for Leading Cities Professional for a leading cities professional by the international um, by international organization Music Cities Events in 2020. Um, throughout 2016 and 17, uh, both Jake and Anita contributed to the development of Kansas City's application to the to UNESCO to become a member city of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, making it the only designated city of music in the United States. Um, I'm sure both look forward to the day when uh, Creative City KC can once again support our great Kansas City musicians to travel and share their music with the world. And here ahead of International Jazz Day, um, which is tomorrow, uh, we thought this would be the perfect opportunity to discuss a little bit more about what it means to um, have Kansas City be a creative city of music. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Jake Wagner and Anita Dixon to the program. Hello. <laughs> Hello. If you like to turn on your uh, video when you get a Hello? chance there, Anita. OK. Uh, um, Did I start my own video here? Should be able to. I hit it, and it's not working. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, gosh. Well, uh, <laughs> hold on, everyone. We will get this uh, taken care of. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, we should be all set now. Sorry about that. <laughs> there we are. There we are. <laughs> Gosh. Hey. Okay. You know, still, still a year uh, plus into using Zoom, and I, I still exactly. learn something new. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So. Exactly. Well, thank you, thank you so much for for joining today. We we really appreciate it. Um, the work that both of you have done um, for for Kansas City. Um, music community is um, remarkable, and it means a lot that you took some time out of your day to, to be a part of this. Thanks Very, for having us. Yeah, certainly. Well, you know, why don't we uh, just go ahead and, and dive right in. Um, to help us understand Kansas City as a, as a musical city, um, 
Would you mind kind of br maybe briefly painting the uh, the musical heritage and the both the heritage and kind of the current musical landscape here in Kansas City? Uh, you want me to start, Jacob? <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. Well, um, I can bring it from a personal perspective as a young uh, woman living in the uh, community many years ago. I remember sleeping in the park because it was hot outside and hearing bands and things over in Parade Park and having no idea that I was listening to du Lou Donaldson or that I was listening to uh, Count Basie who had come to town or various people like that. And the musical heritage of Kansas City is storied uh, all over the world. You know, it is the epicenter for the swing era of jazz. You know, it is where dance floors held 2000 people at one time. And it is, like I said, part of a, of, of an economic development place that when the rest of the world was deep in a depression, Kansas City was not because of, you know, its political landscape, but mostly because musicians had a place to go. There was money. There was things like that. So this is part of the heritage and the history that I personally can remember and see now. I'll just add a little bit more to that. I think um, when you apply to an organization like UNESCO, you have to make an international case that your music and creativity have impacted the world. And fortunately, that's relatively easy to do from Kansas City's perspective. So Anita and I worked on all the archive data around uh, the Kansas City musicians, especially Local 627, and where the members of the union had traveled in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, looking at the diffusion of Kansas City jazz through the travels of our kind of top 10 musicians. And I would say, you know, we have a vibrant music scene, at least we, we did before COVID-19, um, made it difficult to play live music, but we still have an amazing concentration of musicians and producers who draw on that heritage and some who don't uh, and draw on different sources of, of inspiration for their music. But the important part, when you make an argument to UNESCO and to the UNESCO Creative City Network, is that not only are you bringing that heritage to the table, but you want to use that heritage and creativity to drive a sustainable culture. And so that's what Anita and I have really been working on over the past four years is how do we connect better to the world so that the world understands what's happening in Kansas City? Absolutely. Absolutely. Via the history, the heritage and the history is, like I said, storied everywhere else. And when you combine that with understanding about what the rest of the world knows about you, you know, then it becomes something that's very, very important, not only the Kansas City sustainable communities and the various things that are part of things, it also becomes a part of what the rest of the world sees as sustainability. So we, we, we have a big footprint in the world as, as a music city. So well, as a matter of fact, uh, we are the only creative city of music uh, in UNESCO in the United States. So that's another big one. Yeah, you know, it, it, it certainly is. Um, it's what a, what a designation that is. And, you know, maybe for those who aren't, aren't familiar, familiar, can you uh, maybe just describe a little bit uh, about what exactly the UNESCO Creative Cities Network is? Can you, can you, um, you know, elaborate uh, a little bit more about what that is? And, you know, what does it, what does it mean for, for Kansas City to be, to be a part of that? Jacob, I'll let you take that one because you get, you get, you're good at the. Okay. <laughs> The facts and the figures. Yeah, um, you well, you, you know, UNESCO is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And the United States is a founding member of uh, the United Nations and of UNESCO. And, and the whole purpose of UNESCO and the United Nations is to build peace in the minds and hearts of women and men around the world. And so for, you know, several generations now, UNESCO has been at the forefront of making sure that development around the world is peaceful and benefits uh, a broad range of people. Uh, and in 2015, they passed the Sustainable Development Goals. 
And that was really a movement to recognize that we have a lot of work to do around the world in terms of making our relationship with the earth healthier, with each other, more peaceful and more sustainable. And so those 17 sustainable development goals really are a driving component of the UNESCO Creative City Network. In the realm of, the, of UNESCO programs, the UNESCO Creative City Network is relatively new. It, is, uh, it was founded in 2004 and several cities joined in 2006, including our sister city of Seville, Spain, joining in 2006 as the first UNESCO Creative City of Music. And so when Anita and I worked on the application, the point was we already have relationships through the International Relations Council, sister cities, through Anita's work with the Ben Webster Foundation in Copenhagen, et cetera. We have international relationships that are about using creativity as a form of diplomacy, and especially music in terms of our musicians going to Hanover, Germany, or, or visiting going down to San Cristobal de las Casas in Mexico just a few years ago. So the point of the UNESCO Creative City Network is to use music and creativity to connect people across national boundaries and to build shared bridges in terms of the kinds of program strategies that are going to make our cities healthier, more sustainable and provide ways that we can achieve those 17 sustainable development goals. So Thanks. Kansas City, Missouri is a member city of the UNESCO Creative City Network, and that is part of the UNESCO programs based out of UNESCO in Paris. And what it means to Kansas City specifically is that we get an opportunity to have a turnkey opportunity, you know, to, to be able to directly impact other countries, other cities, other people, other musicians, other creative aspects without, you know, trying to figure it out. You know, so many times you find people's, well, how do you get to this and how do you get to that? UNESCO is a turnkey of over 200 cities who are doing similar activities that are connecting similar things together. So with Kansas City being the only creative city of music in the United States, we kind of like have this huge responsibility to be certain that this isn't just utilized to you know, promote what's here, but utilized to become a true member of the world market, a true member of the international movement that music can bring to an institution that can bring to a city. You know, it's, it's much more than just, hey, hop on a plane and come to a concert. You know, it's actually, hey, how do we change communities? How do we bring uh, economic development through creative to underserved communities? How do we turn cities into more economic development opportunities for jobs and various things like that? It says that in the sustainable development goals that in 2050, um, every place on the planet just about will be, some place on the planet will be urbanized. There will be cities everywhere in, by 2050. That's, you know, that's not too far from here. And with that, $225 trillion is what is now the creative industry market worldwide. In the United States is 997 billion. In the Midwest alone, it's something like $400 billion and generates so many jobs that now creative industries worldwide is outpacing construction, transportation, travel and tourism. And so with those kinds of ability, UNESCO being a creative city of UNESCO, particularly in music, it gives us an opportunity to spread our wings and do much more than what tourism is, is identified as right now. Okay, so yeah, Kansas City is sitting in a very, very unique position in world history right now because we are literally defining what it means to be a creative cities in the vein of economic development, in the vein of creative industries. So it's, it's really something. One thing I'll add, Evan, is that when you apply to become a member city of the UNESCO Creative City Network, you have to choose. 
And there are seven areas of creativity. And those areas include uh, craft and folk art. So indigenous traditions around the world in terms of crafts and folk art design in terms of architecture, urban design, graphic design, media, um, film, creativity through film, creative uh, creativity through food, through gastronomy, creativity through media arts, music, and uh, I think that's the seven. I think I hit all seven of them. Um, the point of it is that you have to choose one which is very hard to do because if you look at a city like Kansas City, we have a very strong architecture and design and engineering uh, economy here. And so a lot of our firms that do global work are actually in design. So the question might be, well, why didn't you go for design? The reason we didn't go for design is because our economy is extremely well developed in the area of architecture, engineering, design, even graphic arts and visual arts. We wanted to dig back deep into the community and say, we have been missing, this area of creativity has been underdeveloped. And as we build a new airport, as we build, extend a streetcar, as we're building and expanding the infrastructure for tourism through the investment in hotels and larger convention centers, you have to give people a reason to come to your city more than just the infrastructure. People don't come for the infrastructure. They come for things like, I can go see, uh, you know, the childhood home of Charlie Parker. I can go see where Mary Lou Williams lived. I can go see the Mutual Musicians Foundation, the Jazz Museum. I can go experience live local music in a city that has a story that goes beyond each one of our own lives that is bigger, bigger than each one of us. And so when you think about it, you, you've got to pick, but you, we, we selected music strategically. Uh, because we saw a real underdevelopment that had an opportunity to grow and become a bigger economic development. And as Anita said, to make sure that the so-called underserved communities, African-American communities, communities of color, are at the table in terms of creating that economy, that new economy in terms of creativity. And that has been one of our primary goals over the last four years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, you know, as someone who is relatively new to Kansas City uh, within the last year and a half, um, Kansas City's status as, as a city of music, as a city uh, of jazz is, um, in my opinion, very well represented. And I'm sure that is due to both both the work of, of you and, and many others who make it a primary uh, motivation to, to have that identity. Because um, as you said, it's important for cities to have that identity to increase increase tourism and and, and, increase, and really show off um, the the heritage of the city which has been a, a great jazz city since uh, you know the, the early 1900s um, so that kind of leads me into my next question what what is it about music um, that what is it about music that um, creates a sense of diplomacy that traditional, you know, governmental diplomacy cannot. What is that, that, that um, kind of mystical element about, about music that, that bonds us, that creates this sort of uh, universal language, which is kind of a, a, you know, a relatively cliche phrase that people throw around, but it's, there's so much truth to that. You know, can you describe in your own words what it is about, and maybe that's a, that's a personal question uh, more than as much as anything, but um, I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. <laughs> In 2015, we uh, bought a group of Danes over uh, uh, from Copenhagen uh, for a number of things, and we can get into that later. But one of the things that we did, we did one of the first uh, media tours in 2015, and uh, it was called Jazz No Language Required. Okay, and that came upon understanding without question that when we started working with the Ben Webster Foundation, there's so much background in this, and I know we can't go through it all, but you know, in the research and the development of writing something called UNESCO, there was all kinds of different information asked. But we got that rocket grant. Was that what it was, Jacob? Yeah, the rocket grant that we were able to connect to Ben Webster, who was an incredible saxophone player that used to live here in Kansas City. Well, he's buried in Copenhagen. 
So I made the trip, or I like to call it the pilgrimage at this point, to go and talk to the gentleman from the Wet Ben Webster Foundation and to go and uh, put flowers and, you know, homage to Ben Webster where he was buried. Well, when we got there to where he was buried, he was buried around the corner from another story figure, Hans Christian Andersen. And that kind of blew my mind because had he been buried in the United States, he would have been buried in a segregated cemetery. So here is this dynamic of this incredible saxophone player, African-American who goes to Copenhagen, dies and is just as revered in his death in a place where, you know, one of the greatest storytellers in, in history resides. Right. So right. by then, I uh, was making connections and things because we were um, working on some projects together. And I got it in my head to go to the embassy, just showed up at the American embassy in Copenhagen and was very well received. Like, oh my goodness, you're here from Kansas City? Oh my God, we know Kansas City. Oh, you know, it was like I was like Dorothy from Oz or something. <laughs> and I got in there and we started talking about the importance of what had happened in the last 60 years in Copenhagen between the music of Kansas City and the people that came. And they walked me down this corridor in the embassy where I saw pictures of Ben Webster and Duke Ellington and Tina Turner and people who had come to Copenhagen. Jay McShann, then, Ben Webster, all the Webster, Kansas City connections. It was amazing that this type of revelry was there within the embassy within the embassy. Like if I'd, have, if I'd have lost my passport, I'd have been the first person to get a new one. You know, because, you know, I was from this storied place called Kansas City. Right. You know, I went to a nightclub. I was taken to several of them while I was there. And come to find out they were honoring me being there from Kansas City. And everyone there, the swing dancing was off the chain. I was surprised. But they played ragtime. They played uh, bebop in another place. They played the ragtime in a place that had been a pub since 1898. Okay. Then when we went to the other place the other night, the, the, the next night, they played the entire Kansas City sound, 627 stomp, you know, everything. They knew it all. Didn't speak a word of English. But the yeah. guy who singing, sang in English, but only spoke, <laughs> you know, and I was, I, I was just blown away because that's what they knew about us. So it was like, ah, oh, Anita Dixon from Kansas City is here. Right. And that made me know then that I could literally walk into any embassy in the world because of these names that came behind me. I could literally walk into any embassy in the world and be recognized without having to know the language if I knew just who I was talking to or something like that. And that's what woke me up with the sheer diplomacy of what I was doing. You know, not just, you know, helping or being there or seeing a sightseeing. It went even deeper than that. So that that was one of the most exciting things to learn at that time. Just I, wow. Yeah, exactly. And I think this idea that um, music has um, many different languages, many different dialects, and that people can learn to speak these different, um, we call them genres of music. But the point of it is, there's an energy and a feel to the Kansas City sound. And what's really cool right now about um, the Danish Copenhagen and even sort of the Northern European scene is they know where the music comes from and they value swing. And so they also are playing for dancers. And I think it was Albert Murray, the, the famous writer who really defined the Kansas City sound as having as much to do with, you know, the velocity and the celebration of swing as a dance experience 
as the music itself, a, a music of entertainment, a music of of joy and a music of swing. And that's very different than kind of the classic view of bebop from maybe a, a Charlie Parker perspective where, you know, there was something else going on as far as uh, the communication and the language. And so what's important, I think, is that um, it's not really a universal language. I would say it's a universal set of languages with many different dialects. And what's beautiful is you don't want to lose any language. You don't want to, you know, there was a story recently about some of the uh, endangered indigenous languages of the Midwest for native people here in the Midwest. You know, the whole thing with UNESCO is they value culture and cultural heritage and the preservation of intangible culture, which is, it's one thing to preserve Charlie Parker's saxophone and send it down to, you know, Disney World for a month. It's a different thing to teach young people coming up the value of a bebop scale or how to do swing dance in relationship to a Count Basie uh, big band song. So for us, I think being able to come on the international stage, understand the deep, deep history of Kansas City jazz, as well as people's living commitment to the living culture, keeping the music alive today is critical. And as Anita said, that opens doors. It, it, it's, it builds, you know, brothership and community between people who've just met. You know, when we were in Poland in 2018 for our first UNESCO Creative City annual meeting, people already knew, you know, Kansas City. Oh, yeah. And they would sing the song, right? Oh, and so, God. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the world knows Kansas City. We're trying to remind Kansas City why the world knows who we are and that music is a big part of it yes absolutely i you know i i couldn't agree more with that with that sentiment and you know and and what you you said about keeping keeping this um music alive and current and avoiding it from you know slipping into a sort of repertory um art form is is so important and i think um you know, if I if I talk to other other, you know, perhaps young people, sometimes my my peers, I mean, it's easy to forget, like you said, that that jazz very much was the dance music. It was the pop music of the time, and uh, you know, unfortunately, that notion has been lost to a certain extent. But there is a group that that um, keeps that alive, that that spirit alive, and that that's just so important um, to for the art form to to completely to continue to grow. And, and evolve. Um, evolve. Yeah. Evolution is very important. Evolution <laughs> is very important. I, I hear this. I hear this said so often about um, where is jazz going next? Where is jazz going next? And um, I see that being debated all over the world at this point. But if you know the standards, you already know where it's going next, because it kind of repeats in the situation, at least from what I, my observations, you know, there have been uh, those who are so good at the repetition of, of, of a particular sound, you know, that they've mastered that, but then there's the improvisational nature of that, that kind of gets lost in what that was at one time, you know, what is, uh, what, what made it swing? You know, don't mean a thing. What made it swing? What were those things? What were the outlining conditions in a neighborhood where uh, a band could get together and it would be a swing at night much more than it would be another? I was uh, lucky enough to be in uh, New York at Jazz at Lincoln Center and was asked to be a speaker. I don't know why they let me do that, but... <laughs> I was listening to one of the professors and he got up and he started talking about the importance of the swing era and how, you know, the, the band member would, the band, uh, the band leader would, you know, decipher and decide that, you know, this horn section was going to do this. And, and he made it very, very clinical. And when it got to be my turn, I said, well, you know, let me say this in Kansas city, there were like room for 2000 people on the floor sometimes. And acoustics weren't always the best. So the piano, which was the rhythm and the guitar and the singer got the mic and the horn section had to blow their heads off 
in order to be able to be heard so that the people could dance. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've had that all analyzed, but it was all about who could make you get up and sweat. That's what it was about. And Count Basie and Duke Ellington, when they asked Duke Ellington, how, how, why was his band the this, that, and the other? And he said, he leaned everybody and he says, I paid them a lot of money. <laughs> And, you know, it was, it's just that simple in the era that we lived in, you know, it was a dance thing and it hit everywhere in the world. You should have seen Hitler just appalled by the swing kids in Europe. You know, how does this thing, you had to have the sound and you had to be able to project that sound way beyond that. And the acoustics of today weren't available. So, you know, I, I kind of blew that guy's class a little bit, but he was kind of angry. But I'm like, you know, take it out of that whole thing and break it down to community. You know, let them know that the community demanded the best sounds. The dancers wanted the best sound. And you competed for that in order to make the money, in order to bring the people together. And if you had a tune you know, like 627 Stomped or something like that, named after someone, you know, they came to hear you so they could swing, okay? And so we kind of get messed up in the in the uh, really esoteric educational background of jazz and, you know, Coltrane did a wonderful mathematic equation and things like that. I get all that, but when it comes to the meshing of the music and the people, people want to leave out the people they served. And the people they served were their audiences. Okay, and their audiences demanded a certain amount of, and that demand grew so big that it crossed waters. You know, and that's what, that's what I like to see us, that's what our, application contained that that soul that improvisational nature that was who we were even though we had the research even though we had all of those things that they asked for they asked for quite a bit more than that and that quite a bit more than that was the soul of who we are and that that for me that's where it came from plus a lot of work from from jacob students <laughs> You know, it's always good to know where somebody lived and you walk by their house and you did not know they were there. You know, that's Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I and I suppose that's what makes um, jazz such a, a powerful art form um, is is the notion that it can fulfill both a, a highly intellectual role and also the best jazz can also make your body move in a way that um, I, the best I, dance music can, you know, whether I, it's, you know, Basie, whether it's uh, Charlie Parker, whether it's Cecil Taylor, all this music, while on the surface level, very different, it, it both um, challenges uh, your, your, your head, your, your brain, you makes you makes you think um, thoughts that, you know, maybe you, you re repress, but it, it also, um, you can't help but, but, but move to that music. And that's, and that's, to me, um, what makes uh, this music so so powerful? Um, yeah, Kansas City Jazz, I think, is known around the world as a swing dance experience, and obviously bebop expanded on that, and and also, you know, through the symbol at that, and and tried to upend it and reinvent it and turn it inside out and adjust to the small combo economic reality of the post. World War II changes that were going on as it became harder to, you know, run a, a 15 or a 20 piece band around the country like it was earlier. So things have to change and adapt. We were talking about, you know, innovation and survival of the music. One of the things I find most exciting is the work of Marcus Lewis here in town with mm -hmm. Kimmett Coleman and the crew that's really, they're, they're sustaining the big band sound. They're writing new charts, they're writing new, uh, new lyrics, new words. And at the same time, they are sus they're sustaining musicians playing live music, playing big band music, which is absolutely critical, but um, infusing it with our current, uh, you know, experience and feel of 
of hip hop. And that combo is absolutely critical to thinking about where we are right now. So I'm very thankful for, for Marcus Lewis um, and his work, you know, uh, with Brash and, Brass and Bougie. I think that's a really critical innovation. Absolutely. And, you know, recognizing him and his work. Um, and that, that's part of, you know, what matters for UNESCO as well, not just playing these great songs from the past, but reinventing the tradition for, for where we are today and where we're going in the future. Right, absolutely. I think um, when we talk about hybridization, you know, this uh, integration of, of jazz and hip hop that we've seen, you know, over the last 10, 15 years is so, has been so critical for, for keeping the music vibrant and that, that hip hop feel um, has really become, in essence, the new swing feel. Um, and that is so, that's incredibly exciting because that um, is the perfect blending of, of two eras and I think has allowed a lot of young people to, uh, an, an entry point to the music that maybe if they, if they listen to um, an older record that they may not have quite that, that, um, that common ground that maybe they would um, with some of, uh, you know, modern music, whether like you said, Marcus, Marcus um, Lewis's projects or, or, you know, someone like Robert Glasper or something like that. that sure, sure, has, sure. Has blended those worlds so well. Right, um, right. So, you know, we, we've talked uh, a lot about, uh, you know, these positive elements of, of music and, and diplomacy and, and all these, um, these incredibly wonderful uh, developments that have come about. What are still some underutilized ways in which music can serve a greater part in in cross cultural communication? What are what are some ways we can we can still improve and and further um, you know connect connect with one another through through music? We we could get much more serious about public education and music again. I mean, ridiculously politically, marching around with signs opportunities for more education. You know, when the last 40 years is telling the story on uh, the absence of music within public teaching, okay, about what people are capable of doing within math, what they're capable of doing, you know, in, in essay writing and things, it all comes down to missing a piece of your education. Um, because of that, uh, we spent three and a half years actually working with the Department of Labor because it was a lineage thing that went on, right? You took classes in school, but you had a required music study from the time you toddled in until you left high school, required music. And some people took to it, some people did not, but it was available to you. But there was a lineage that went on. So I was working with the uh, American Federation of Musicians in New York, trying to figure out why we were losing all these incredible musicians to Europe and various places like that. And um, I asked them that they have an apprenticeship program and they said no. And one of the reasons why they never had, it's a 108 year old organization. One of the reasons why they did not have an apprenticeship program was because they never needed one. There was a lineage through high, through, through, through public school systems that got them the Count Basies and the, you know, those people were teachers to other people. So when we went to investigate getting an apprenticeship for um, musicians, it did not exist in the Department of Labor, did not. Li musicians were listed as an occupation, but not a profession to be apprenticed. So it took three and a half years to convince the Department of Labor that being a musician is a labor intensive job. And that- Profession. Yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. a profession, Skilled labor profession. intensive, on the job training, everything that you identify for a plumber, you can identify for a musician. And so once we received our uh, registered apprenticeship, come to find out we were the only, again, the only registered apprenticeship for the Department of Labor for musicians. And we're still having to jump those hoops about what that means, because what we're trying to accomplish is the return of musician, the, the, the return of music to public schools to public opportunities. So this is what we're trying to do and to return that level of thinking, you know, to children 
who that has just been, and you can see it, you can see it in the music. You can see it that, you know, who, what, what is a more affluent neighborhood by its music classes that are available. You know, you go into uh, urban communities and stuff and you can't find but one or two. And if they do, they have to travel miles and miles to find themselves someone who can take care of these things. But that is one of the reasons why our UNESCO designation is so important because we're able to address music from much more than a cultural enrichment opportunity. Now it is job creation. Now it is job, you know, is job readiness. Now it can be that because the world market is demanding American genres. And when you go to a country and they have what they call a BAM, a Black American music uh, festival, and there's not but one Black person on stage singing the Supremes in Motown, you know, there's a disconnect in the United States, you know, because we could be sending them those people. We could be making jobs and money and things like that doing that. But because we have this, this missing thing within the education system, you know, bringing it back to education, that's what needs to happen. We need to get dead double dog serious on education and public education for musicians and music in order to sustain our position in the world as these innovative people. Yeah, that's why I like uh, our new first lady. <laughs> Maybe I can talk to her about this over lunch. There you go. There you go. That's a plan. <laughs> that's a great plan. For sure. For sure. So that's one of the things that we think, um, you know, being UNESCO Creative City, like I said, being the only one in the United States, there's this tremendous opportunity, this tremendous responsibility too, because we can't just think for Kansas City. We have to think for the music. We have to think for what is, you know, going to be the future for musicians once, um, you know, we either return to UNESCO because that's another story. Um, we can't apply for any more music cities to assist us in this thing because of last administration pulled us out of UNESCO. Well, now we have a responsibility to open that conversation back up. Because there's Nashville, there's Chicago, there's New York. We could be making jobs and stuff for musicians, young people, an education that would, you know, far eclipse what's happening around the world. But because we do not have that, you know, it, it, it is actually the responsibility of Kansas City to start the conversation. And we've been doing that. As far as other underutilized ways, uh, as far as the role of music, I think Anita talked a lot about education, job readiness. One of the things that we uh, had the opportunity to do in participating in the UNESCO Creative Cities Network was to listen to other cities talk about the way they've used music and creativity to solve social challenges. And so in particular, when you listen to you know, what's happened in a country like Colombia with a civil war and how they had to use art and music and creativity to put, literally put their country back together after a civil war. Um, you know, you can think about the importance of the arts and creativity in terms of cultural survival, in terms of rebuilding, um, de-escalating the violence. I mean, we've got all this violence in our society right now and whatever we're doing isn't working, right? And so who, who's good at inventing new approaches? Artists, creative people, musicians. And what brings people you know, together more than music because it is a different kind of form of communication that is emotional. It, it, it hits on a whole different uh, realm of your brain and your body and your, your emotions. And so what is really an underutilized way of using music for diplomacy is international or even domestic relationships of rebuilding and reducing conflict or recovering from collective trauma. So 
the you know it it's absolutely critical in talking about the recovery of the country after COVID nineteen that we start talking about the role of musicians and creative people, and them getting compensated for the work they do to help put things back together. You know you can't just go back to a concert and act like nothing happened. Right. right. And so we've got to, in terms of audience development, in terms of musician support, we have to have new approaches where we go beyond just marketing uh, music to a more cultural, public oriented kind of no, not about commodification of the music, but about music as a cultural experience to bring people together. And that's what we need to invest in. We need public dollars to reinvest in education, everything from you know beginning all the way up to professional musicians should be getting paid to help put the country back together and to to process all this trauma that we've been through uh especially in the last few years and so those are underutilized and when you listen to what other cities have done they clearly have used music and creativity to put their society and their cities back together after these kinds of experiences that we've had here in the united states so i think that's a completely underutilized way of using music and i and, and another underutilized way is is the health of a, of a, i want to say overall health of our people in our communities okay it's not enough to even have this stuff available if everybody's so sick, okay? Or no one can reach you. You know, one of the biggest health disparities that we have is a transportation problem, okay? And within underserved communities and people of color communities, you know, you may have the greatest thing going since peanut butter, you know, but if you're way on the other side of town, you know, and uh, you know, you say, "Oh, yeah, we're we're doing this for the underserved." How do they know about you? You know, what? Are, are, who are you relying on? You know, to be certain that this kid may get out of school and may be hungry, but he's on his way to his 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 um music, music class. class. Mm -hmm. You know, so you so the overall health of a community needs to be taken into consideration you know, when you're talking about education as an underutilized opportunity, the overall health of who you're dealing with, you know, the trauma that they deal with on a different, a daily basis. And it doesn't even have to be just urban experiences. You know, I'm finding kids in rural communities who cannot, who don't even have bus routes like the kids in the urban communities do, okay? So they're losing out. So there's this continuous disconnect that people think if they just supply the program, everybody's gonna be there. And if they do two or two, two or three things in a year that brings out a lot of kids and yay, we did it, and you know, let's do it again next year, they're missing what the disconnect is. Mm -hmm. Let's let's mm -hmm. talk an overall holistic approach mm -hmm. to this thing in the United States. Let's talk about health, let's talk about transportation. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about those things, you know, for a town as big as we are, for there not to be light rail all over the place. It's kind of like, you know, you go to Copenhagen, who needs a car? Mm -hmm. No one, because it's <laughs> that advanced in what they do. So we need to start talking that overall holistic look at what we're doing before we start pouring a lot of money into programming. You know, people, people say I'm the city planner, but it's really Anita, actually. <laughs> you should have seen her when we were in Poland and somebody some mayor from I think it was like Kortrick in the Netherlands was talking about this the way the parking worked and how they made sure the parking turned up man she lit up like a light bulb she was so excited she's like oh we need that in Kansas City we so, need yeah. that so bad because sometimes I just want to stop in for five minutes exactly and some parking hog yeah you know the park all day yeah doing nothing and they won't even pull out yeah but in, you know poland they had a system it was all underground your car you know wonderful this right. is this right. approach that we're talking about fix this stuff mm -hmm. and the people themselves will start fixing the other stuff you know we call it the jewel box effect you know when you have this you know the story goes that a gentleman was given a jeweled box by a king and he took it home, he put it on his mantelpiece and he looks, took a step back and saw, dang, I could fix my mantle. So he fixes it and he steps back again and says, my house is a mess. So he gets back and he does it again 
And he looks around, his neighbors start seeing him changing his house. So they start changing theirs. It is the jewel box of that give them something so valuable that they're able to step back and see what else is needed. It's always the, the savior thoughts of so many of these organizations and sponsors and stuff. You know, we're going to go in here and we're going to put on our capes and we're going to save this whole community without giving them a jewel box. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's not what's starting the process from the inside right. out. Yeah. So people can do it. Yeah. If people, people can do it. To do it. So I see a question in the chat here from uh, uh, Matthew Hughes. Matthew, mm -hmm. thanks for joining us. Another IRC uh, leader here in town. He says, what countries do you admire for the way they have packaged music for international sharing and cultivated artists and music professionally domestically? Honestly, um, I was super impressed in Poland. Uh, music Export Poland has been a great partner of ours. They have been uh, working with us to promote the UNESCO Creative Cities of Music. We do Make Music Day, which we'll be doing again here internationally, June 21st, look for the program. We did a program last year with uh, more than 20 cities around the world. And it was all put together by Music Export Poland uh, and our good friend Tamara from the music city of Katowice, Poland. And um, so they're, I mean, they're doing amazing work in Poland to promote their own musicians and they take it very seriously. They provide, um, you know, not just, they, they expect that when you're doing your work, you're not like streaming your music from your bedroom, right? That they want to see a professional level of performance and production and, and packaging of that music experience so that you can have really good sound uh, and, um, you know, very impressive levels of media and technology uh, from our friends in Poland. We were also very impressed with our collaboration with our friends down in San Cristobal, Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, San Cristobal de las Casas, we invited uh, us to send uh, a group of musicians down. We were able to send down uh, Professor Odell Talley and Bukeka Blakemore uh, and um, uh, Brian Alford and Lee Langston, who all went down in, in 2018 in the fall to perform in, in Mexico for a cultural exchange. And Anita was saying earlier, it's not just about, you know, having a concert and, oh, great, look at us. It's actually, are you learning from each other? Is the music a form of diplomacy? Is there in cultural learning going on? Do the musicians learn each other's music? Do they learn to play and share in those traditions? Do they understand the connections? And there's, uh, Odell tells a really funny story about how the kids <laughs> recognized that, you know, here were these African-American musicians in Mexico and they were like, hey, man, Wakanda forever, you know? And so there's this sense of, you know, wow, this international connection through music. The young people were able to learn classic African-American hymns and gospel tunes. And our Kansas City musicians were able to learn and sing music in Spanish. And they all connected through the African marimba, which is in both cultures. And so that's the kind of thing we're talking about, more than just a performance. Uh, and we're currently working with our friends down in Frutillar, Chile, who want us to uh, you know, have a, a group of musicians come down for their music days, uh, hopefully in 2022 or 2023 based on what happens with the vaccine and, and with COVID. But the point of it is, you know, there's some really great opportunities to connect. And I would say, Matthew, that there are so many uh, uh, amazing uh, musicians around the world who are eager to connect uh, through music. And it's so much easier these days with media and technology to do that. And Chris Avery says, uh, love thinking holistically regarding transportation. My three months in Armenia were wonderful due to the 20 cent metro that could take me anywhere. <laughs> Are there other organizations regionally such as Artists Inc that you partner with for programs? It, that, that's one great regional thought. We have recently begun um, working together with other people within the re region and that'll be an introduction uh, uh, here in June about the importance of the Midwest to the building of uh, creative industries within the United States. Uh, we need to understand that we are, we are uh, a unique grouping of states and we need to have more of a holistic approach to that too than separate 
opportunities because everybody thinks East and West Coast and they know all the things that are going on in those areas. But when you think Midwest landlocked, all the various things that are part of what we are, you know, the opportunities are greater internationally doing those things when we connect regionally on these things. But then again, you know, the, we've got organizations that do that, but what they lack, and thank God we have now, is the turnkey. You know, you, you can get people in the room and everybody's got an idea and you can say, you know, does anybody know anyone in Fruityard Chile? And they can look at you and go, no, but we do. You know, not only do we, but we can call them right now, tomorrow, yesterday, Jerusalem, uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, Africa. You know, those are the places. That is what the value to this UNESCO designation is. We can pull together anything we need to and immediately make a contact and make something happen. And that, that was the whole thing about the urgency of becoming UNESCO Creative City. And thank God we did do it. You know, the thing about writing that application, I, I call it the, one of the greatest things I've ever done professionally because it made me sit down and every conversation I ever had with great musicians and with particularly this gentleman here because all of the research that I had, I had via his office, via his work. And I was able to draw on that opportunity and draw on what I knew personally as a tourism developer and write that thing because it is a monster application if anyone has ever seen it. And it is now, you know, really, uh, it needs to be in a museum somewhere <laughs> because the, the effort that it took, it wasn't effortless. I just knew where to go. I didn't have to have to search and we, I knew exactly where to go, exactly the information, where it was. And it was working directly with, uh, Jacob and pulling those things together and then having this immense knowledge of heritage and history that I could draw on. And it was quite an honor when we woke up on October 31st, 2017. And they said, congratulations, Kansas City. You're a member yeah. city. Yeah. 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 Well, you're a member city. yeah, gosh. I mean, what, what an honor, what an honor it is. And, you know, my, my heart goes out to both you and Jake. Jake and Anita for, for the, the work that you put in, the, the commitment you have here locally, while also thinking globally um, about music's role in, in society, it, it means so much. And I know um, there's so many people who are, are grateful to you out there. So I, I appreciate your work on, on the application, the continued work that you do and will do in the future as well as joining us today um, for this panel program. I, I sincerely appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank Join you us much. on Make Music Day in Dunbar Park, June 21st. We're going to do another part of our final part of our application, because this is our four-year report to remain within the remain within the network. And we're doing the Voyage of the Drum, which tells the story of the drum as one of the first instruments of humanity. And we've got about 10 countries that are joining us on video but we're going to be holding a big celebration of Voyage of the Drum in Dunbar Park, along with the uh, Neighborhood Association, Dunbar Neighborhood Association. In heart Kathy of the City. Kathy yeah. Persley, Heart of the City, City. yep. And uh, it is an international opportunity uh, all around the world, Make Music Day. And so there'll also be a video, uh, a live stream, so people can watch it from wherever they are. And we'll also be doing uh, another partnership with the other cities of music as well. So people can see what we're doing in Kansas City, but they can also see what's happening. And now there are almost, there are over 40 different UNESCO creative cities of music around the world. So there are a ton of other cities to work with besides the other 200 uh, creative cities overall. Uh, so we encourage people to get online and check out what's available for sure. Yeah. Yeah. One of our main partners is the Kansas City Museum, and we wanted to make sure that people, uh, you know, check out their website, their YouTube page for the Kansas City Museum. We most recently have recorded a Kansas City Museum session for the International Day of Jazz, which is tomorrow, mm -hmm. featuring some of our favorite women in jazz. Yes. And that, uh, that, that is available on YouTube through the Kansas City Museum and their Kansas City Museum sessions. So check, check it that out. out. Yeah. Yeah, certainly, everybody. Please, please check that out. Um, have a wonderful International Jazz Day. Go celebrate. 
um, a, you know, an art form that is truly uniquely American, why it draws through um, a lineage of, of influences throughout time. I mean, ultimately, uh, to me, that is uh, America's greatest export. Um, so please uh, go and go. celebrate. Um, and uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for this uh, Global Horizons Day. Um, thank you again to Jake and Anita for, for taking thank some you. time today. And um, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your evenings. We hope to see you on a future IRC program. And I have also just posted a, a brief survey in the um, chat. If you have just a, a few moments just to fill out a few questions, we'd deeply appreciate it. But enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Evan. Yeah. See you later. Goodbye.